from around the globe, it's theCUBE with digital coverage of Red Hat Summit 2020, brought to you by Red Hat. Welcome back to theCUBE's coverage of Red Hat Summit 2020. Of course, this year, it's rather than all coming to San Francisco, we are talking to Red Hat executives, their partners and their customers, where they are around the globe. Happy to welcome back uh, one of our CUBE alumni, Lisa Spellman, who's a corporate vice president and general manager of the Intel Xeon and uh, Memory Group. Uh, Lisa, thanks so much for joining us. And, and where are you joining us from? Well, thank you for having me. And I'm a little further north than where the conference was going to be held. So I'm in Portland, Oregon right now. Excellent, yeah, uh, we've had uh, you know, customers from around the globe uh, as, as part of the CUBE coverage here. And of course, uh, you're, you're near the mothership of, of Intel. So uh, Lisa, uh, you know, let, let's start, of course, you know, the Red Hat partnership, uh, you know, I, I've seen the Intel executives on the keynote stage uh, for, for many years. So talk about, uh, to start us off, the, the Intel Red Hat partnership as it stands today in 2020. Yeah, you know, on the keynote stage for many years and then actually again this year. Um, so despite the virtual nature of the event that we're having, we're trying to still show up together and demonstrate together to our customers and our developer community, uh, really give them a sense for all the work that we're doing across the important transformations that are happening in the industry. So we view this um, partnership and this event as important ways for us to connect and make sure that we have a chance to really um, share where we're going next and gather feedback on where our customers and that developer community need us to go together because it is a you know rich long history of partnership of the combination of our hardware work and the open source software work that we do with Red Hat. And we see that um, every year increasing in value as we expand to more workloads and more market segments that we can help with our technology. Yeah, well, uh, Lisa, you know, we've seen on the Cube uh, for for many years Intel strong partnerships across the industry, uh, from the data centers, from the cloud. Uh, I think we're going to talk a little bit about edge for this discussion too. So, edge and five G. Um, yeah. I, I think about all the hard work that Intel does, especially with its partnership. You know, you talked about, you know, I think back to the, the early days of Red Hat, you know, the operating system things uh, that were done as virtualization rolled out, there's accelerations yep. that have gone through. Uh, so when it comes to edge and 5G, obviously big mega waves that we spend a lot of talking about, what's what's Intel's piece? Obviously we know Intel chips go everywhere, but when, when it comes to kind of the engineering uh, work that gets done, what, what are some of the pieces that Intel's working on? Yeah, and that's a great example actually of what I um, what we are seeing is this expansion of areas of um, workloads and investment and opportunity that we face. So as we move forward into 5G becoming um, not the theoretical next thing, but actually the thing that is starting to be deployed and uh, transformed, you can see a bunch of underlying work that Intel and Red Hat have done together in order to make that a reality. So you look at the move from a very um, proprietary ASIC based type of workload with a single function running on it. And what we've done is drive to have the virtualization capabilities that took over and provided so much value in the cloud data center also apply to the 5G network. So the move to network function virtualization and software defined networking and a lot of value being derived from the opportunity to run that on open source standards and have that open source community really come together to make it easier and faster to deploy those technologies and also to get good um, SLAs and quality of service while you're driving down your overall total cost of ownership. So we've spent years working on that together in the 5G space and network space in general, and now it's really starting to take off. And then that is very well connected to the edge. So if you think about the edge as this point of content creation of where the action's happening, and you start to think through how much of the compute or the value can I get out at the edge without everything having to go all the way back to the data center, you start to again see um, how those open standards in very complex environments can help people manage their total cost of ownership and the complexity. 
All right, Lisa. So when you're talking uh, about edge solutions, uh, when I've been talking to Red Hat, uh, where uh, their first deployments have really been uh, talking to the service providers, really, I I've seen it as an extension of uh, what you were talking about, network functions, virtualization. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, everybody talks about edges. There's a lot of different edges out there. The service providers uh, being the first place we see things, but you know, all the way out even to the consumer edge and the device edge, um, where Intel may or may not have, uh, you know, some uh, some devices there. So help us understand, you know, where 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 you're sitting uh, and where should we be looking as these technologies mature. You know, it's a it's a great point. We see the edge being developed by multiple types of organizations. So yes, the service providers are obviously there in so much as they already even own the location points out there. If you think of all the myriad of uh, poles with the, the base stations and everything that's out there, that's a tremendous asset to capitalize on. You also see our cloud service provider customers uh, moving towards the edge as well as they think of new developer services and capabilities. And of course you see the enterprise edge coming in. If you think of um, factory type of uh, utilization methodologies or in manufacturing, all of those are very enterprise based and are really focused on not that consumer edge, but on the um, B2B edge or the, you know, uh, the infrastructure edge is what you might think of it as. But they're working through how do they add efficiency, capability, automation, all into their existing um, work, but making it better. So at Intel, the way that we look at that is it's all opportunities to provide the right foundation for that. So when we look at uh, the silicon products that we develop, we gather requirements from that entire landscape and then we work through our silicon portfolio. You know, we have our portfolio really focused on the movement, the storage, and the processing of data. And we try to look at that in a very holistic way and decide where the capability will best serve that workload. So you do have a choice at times whether some new feature or capability goes into the CPU or the Xeon engine, or you could think about whether that would be better served by being added into a SmartNIC type of capability. And so those are just small examples of how we look at the entirety of the data flow in the edge and what the use case is. And then we utilize that to inform how we improve the silicon and where we add features. Well, it, Lisa, as you were going through this, it makes me also think about one of the other big mega waves out there, uh, artificial intelligence. So uh, lots of discussion, uh, as you were saying, what goes where, how we think about it, cloud, uh, edge devices. So how does AI intersect with this whole discussion of edge uh, that uh, we were just having? Yeah, and you're probably gonna have to cut me off because I could go on for a long time on, on this one. But so AI is such an exciting uh, capability that is um, coming through everywhere, literally from the edge, through the core network, into the cloud, and you see it infiltrating every single workload across the enterprise, across cloud service providers, across the network service providers. So it is truly on its way to being completely pervasive. And so again, that presents the same opportunity for us. So if you look at your silicon portfolio, you need to be able to address artificial intelligence all the way from the edge to the cloud. And that can mean adding uh, Silicon capabilities that can handle milliwatts, like ruggedized, super low power, um, super long life, out, you know, literally out at the edge. And then all the way back to the data center where you're going for much higher powered, higher capability for training of the models. So we have built out a portfolio that ad addresses all of that. And one of the interesting things about the edges people always think of it as a low compute area. So they think of it as data collection, but more and more of that data collection is also having a great uh, benefit from being able to do an amount of compute and inference out at the edge. So we see a tremendous amount of actual Xeon product being deployed out at the edge because of the need to actually deliver quite high powered compute right there. And that's improving customer experiences and it's changing use cases through, again, healthcare, manufacturing, automotive. You see it in all the major fast mover edge industries. 
Yeah, no, really good points that you make there, Lisa. Uh, we all got used to, you know, limitless compute in the cloud and therefore, yeah. you know, let's put everything there. But of course we understand there's this little thing called the speed of light uh, that makes it that much of the information that is collected at the edge uh, can't go beyond it. You know, I, I saw a great uh, presentation actually last year talking about the geosynchronous satellites. Uh, they collect so much information and, yes. You know, you can't just beam it back and forth. So I, I better have some compute there. So, you know, we've known for a long time that the challenge of, uh, you know, of our day has been distributed architectures um, and edge just, you know, changes that, uh, you know, the landscape and uh, the, the surface area that we need to touch so much more. Um, when, when I think about all those areas, obviously security uh, is an area that comes up. So how does Intel, uh, and, and its partners make sure that no matter where my data is, and you talk about the, the various memory, that you know security is still considered uh, at, at each aspect of the environment. Oh, it, it's a huge focus because if you think of people and phrases they used to say, like, "Oh, we got to have the fat pipe or the dumb pipe to get you know data back and forth," there is no such thing as a dumb pipe anymore. Everything is smart the entire way through the life cycle. And so with that smartness, you need to have security embedded from the get-go into that workflow. And what people need to understand as they undergo their edge deployments and start that work is that your obligation for the security of that data begins the minute you collect that data. It doesn't start when it's back to the cloud or back in the data center. So you own it and need to be on it from the beginning. So we work across our silicon portfolio and then our software ecosystem to think through it in terms of that entire pipeline of the data movement and making sure that there's not breakdowns in each of the handoff chains. It's a really complex problem and it is not one that Intel is able to solve alone nor any individual silicon or software vendor along the way. And I will say that some of the security work over the past couple of years has led to a bringing together of the industry to address problems together, whether they be on any other given day, a friend or a foe. When it comes to security, I feel like I've seen just an amazing increase over the past two, two and a half years on the collaboration to solve these problems together. And ultimately, I think that leads to a better experience for our users and for our customers. So we are investing in it, not just at the new features from the silicon perspective, but in also understanding um, newer and more advanced uh, threat or attack surfaces that can happen inside of the silicon or the software component. All right, so uh, Lisa, final question I have for you. I want to circle back to where we started. Uh, it's Red Hat Summit this week, long partnerships, uh, as I mentioned, we see Intel at all the cloud shows you partner with, all the hardware, software uh, providers and the like. So big message from Red Hat is the open hybrid cloud. Talk about how that fits in with everything that Intel is doing. It's an area of a really strong interconnection between us and Red Hat because we have a vision of that open hybrid cloud that is very well aligned. And the part about it is that it is rooted not just in here's my feature, here's my feature from either one of us, it's rooted in what our customers need and what we see our enterprise customers driving towards, that desire to utilize the cloud to improve their capabilities and services, but also maintain that capability inside their own house as well so that they have really viable workload transformation, they have opportunities for their total cost of ownership and can fundamentally use technology to drive their business forward. All right, well, Lisa Spellman, thank you so much for all the updates uh, from Intel and definitely look forward uh, to, to seeing the breakouts, the keynotes and the like. Yes, me too. All right, lots more coverage here from theCUBE, Red Hat Summit 2020. I'm Stu Miniman, and thanks as always for watching.